everybody. How are you doing today? Awesome. Got a few woos out there. I'm Jamie Marocker. I am our network health reporter for Global News. So that means I cover everything health, pharma, biotech, science, uh, right across the country here in Canada for our network. And um, today we're talking about a topic that's by no means new in biotech. We're talking about AI and machine learning and how it's at the forefront of how we get new treatments, um, medical research, really how we find cures and, and that it should be at the forefront. But there is a company that stands out and is doing things a little bit differently and that is Recursion. And I'm now joined by the president and CEO, oh, Tina Larson. Tina, thank you so much for being with us today. So tell us a little bit about your background. Well, thank you, Jamie. Pleasure to be here today. And my background is I've um, been in the biotechnology industry for over 20 years. I'm a biochemical engineer by training, and I started in the industry in the mid-90s when the revolutionary platform innovation at the time was recombinant DNA technology to make a whole new class of therapeutics called biologics and got to figure out how to help, you know, be part of the team scaling and delivering that technology to patients. And so fast forward more than 20 years later, now I get to be at Recursion. Once again, uh, Recursion's on this forefront of how we can create the next generations of therapies for patients using technical innovation. So Recursion's really trying to get a better understanding of um, human biology by using data. So tell us a little bit about the specific problems that Recursion is trying to solve right now. Yeah, absolutely. So Recursion, our mission is um, decoding biology to radically improve lives. And so one of the, the ways that we look at re radically improving lives is thinking about developing therapies. And I am a long-term veteran of the biopharmaceutical industry. I love this industry, but the industry is broken in many ways, um, particularly the innovation in the industry. Uh, about 90% of drugs that enter the clinic, so enter actually people, fail to become products. So that's a 90% failure rate. And what that failure rate results in is that failure of innovation. It's very expensive to develop new innovative therapies. On average, to bring one new product to market takes about $2 billion. And so you can imagine if you are somebody who wants to really invest in improving health, improving wellness, and bringing new therapies to market, and you're staring down a 90% failure rate and $2 billion in years of research to bring one new thing to the market, that's a huge problem for our industry. And um, it really is going to require a, a technological um, innovation to break that. And so at Recursion, how we're looking at approaching that problem is really becoming what we believe is going to be the biopharmaceutical industry of the 21st century, and that is a digitally native, technology-enabled, data-first biopharmaceutical company. So essentially what you're doing is my understanding is you're taking mass amounts of data, things that the average person couldn't really dive into and look through, and you're allowing the machine learning to basically peel through that and maybe find solutions that the average person wouldn't find. So can you dive into that a little bit more, um, how the data is used, where you get that data from, and how the AI is working? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to start out. I'm, I'm going to try analogy, Jamie. And so like, let's say you are um, going to a parking lot, and it's dark. It's at night. Um, the parking lot's poorly lit. And then you get to your car, and you realize you've dropped your keys, um, something none of us, a situation, yeah, none of us wants to be in that situation. Uh, and so and then you, uh, you want to go back in the parking lot and find your keys. But the only place you can look for your keys are under the, the street lamps that exist. And there's a lot of dark in between these um, street lamps. And if your keys happen to be in the street lamp, great, in the light of the street lamp. But if they're somewhere in these dark spots, it's going to be very hard to find your keys and get in your car. And so the analogy there to what we're doing at Recursion and to drug development more broadly is the tools that we have today, which are largely based on what we can do as people, are looking at um, biological pathways. So as a human, I can kind of conceptualize a, a, a one-dimensional, two-dimensional pathway in biology. Um, and, and then conceptualize that this biological pathway will result in a disease. And those are kind of the spotlights. And then a, a lot of people will go and look, you know, there's a hypothesis that this biology drives disease. And so we're going to go look and find the drugs um, for that pathway. What that misses is biology is enormously complex. It's far more complex than our kind of one, two, three-dimensional brains can handle. And so there's all of those dark spots in biology, all of those dark spots in the biology of human disease. And what we're trying to do is use technology to shine a flashlight on that. So as you mentioned, we create these very large data sets. Our data set today is 14 petabytes 
uh, which if, if you aren't familiar with petabytes is about 700 times everything in the Library of Congress in the United States. So this is a lot of data. Uh, and what that data set allows us to do is to use our you know, computational tools to explore that and try to shine lights on these dark areas of biology. I mean, we can run models. Computers can look at the biology in a thousand dimensions um, using deep learning models and in a way that, that we couldn't as humans. And so the hope is by um, mapping and then navigating this biology with tools that, that literally did not exist a few years ago, that we're going to be able to understand and, and treat disease in ways that have never been conceived of before. So the AI points to something that maybe the average person who would have been looking at the data didn't see and says, there's a possible treatment here. Can you talk yeah. about the discoveries that have been made and, and what that process has looked like, how it's maybe led to new drugs, treatments, that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think at the, the end of the day, all of this data, the, the point is to get drugs to patients. And so at Recursion, we think about, um, you know, a lot of different ways we can bring these drugs to the world. Uh, there's drugs that we uh, develop on our own hands, and then there's drugs that we work with really top tier, um, fantastic biopharmaceutical partners, um, and, and we partner with them and become their discovery engine. And so uh, on our internal portfolio, a, a few of the things that I'm really excited about, we have four drugs entering human clinical trials this year. Uh, one of those, uh, we actually just announced this week, uh, the trial has started enrolling, and that's in neurofibromatosis 2. That's a genetically d driven disease that affects um, people in childhood, adolescents, um, you know, form benign tumors, and it can um, result in things like hearing loss, vision loss, et cetera. Uh, so we, have, we look at genetic disease. Uh, one of the drugs we have this year going in is infectious disease. We have, um, they're very excited about the um, cancer, the oncology portfolio that, that we're developing internally. Beyond that, with our partners, a couple years ago, we signed a partnership with Bayer Pharmaceuticals, and we're working across fibrotic diseases. So fibrosis, for example, in the lung is when you get very dense tissue in the lung, and it, and it becomes difficult to breathe. Uh, and then, um, and we've been working on, we expanded that partnership last year, and then late last year, we signed um, what is the largest partnership in tech-enabled drug discovery ever signed uh, with uh, Roche Genentech. And we're working on a couple of different disease areas there. Um, including all of neuroscience, uh, which is pretty exciting. If you think about, um, you know, one of those big, massive, dark areas in the parking lot of biology is the treatment of neurological disorders, Alzheimer's, and, and a whole host of other disorders. So really looking forward to having a great partner um, and great scientists like Genentech Roche to, to partner to find new drugs. So um, lots going on. I wish I could spend hours and hours talking about all of them, uh, but, but you know, we don't have that time. <laughs> you're, you're, you're looking into more of the obscure illnesses that don't have treatments and cures. Like you named one right there that's, that's huge that has I've done alone piles of research on, and that's um, Alzheimer's. But you mentioned something else that I want to dive into a little bit, and yeah. that's infectious disease. Obviously, we spent the last two years in a pandemic. COVID-19 has really been um, the main focal point of healthcare, uh, both in a good and bad way, of course, to the detriment of, of some other illnesses. But what has your company done specifically to um, aid with COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, what, what, what crazy times we live in. Um, and so I, I think back to March of 2020 when you know, I think the, the pandemic was coming to the consciousness of many, obviously it had been around a few months before that, uh, we were taking our company remote and we actually took our um, scientific resources and completely pivoted them over of uh, those who volunteered uh, to, to keep working in the labs um, to doing COVID-19 research. And so we started that in March of 2020. And by April of 2022, we'd created a data set of COVID-19 biology. And so both we had to uh, you know, figure out how to model uh, the, the COVID-19 um, biology and disease state in the laboratories. We had some great university partners that had access to the virus. And then we uh, ran that, the results of that, on our technology platform, and we ran it looking at the impact of, of every drug um, in our drug library. And our drug library has most of the known drugs um, in clinical or um, you know, available commercially in the world. And what we did was create a data set. And then by April, we actually put that data set out to the publicly to the scientific community. It's still on our website, if you, if you want to check it out. Uh, we release uh, public data sets um, with some regularity out to the community. And what's really interesting, Jamie, about that, looking back at that today, uh, many of the drugs that we had in that data set um, did go on to go into clinical trials to look at the treatment of COVID-19. Um, and the platform actually predicted eight of the nine outcomes of the clinical trials. Um, it, it, that we now have the data, you know, more than two years later to, to see that. And so I think there's, um, you know, 
beyond even COVID-19, the, the, you know, just that experience of being able to rapidly um, spin up within a few weeks, create a data set of what was obviously novel biology, uh, given the novelty of the pandemic, um, and then have a really powerful um, predictive tool to understand why, what might help, just um, for me speaks a lot to the, the potential in the future. You obviously know this, that uh, data, especially in healthcare, in the world of healthcare, is gold. Um, you need it to be able to do research, to be able to find these cures and treatments, and to push any type of innovation forward. So for you guys, how are you building these massive data sets? Yeah, so uh, you know, we are a data company um, at, at our core. And I think one thing that's really important is that we build the data sets in our own wet laboratories. And I think this is something that really distinguishes recursion um, from you know, the other companies in our sector, uh, we've built the world's largest data set of biology. Um, and I mentioned earlier, 14 petabytes. Uh, what that looks like is that we run up to 2.2 million experiments every week. So right now, uh, back in our laboratories in Salt Lake City, uh, people are running experiments. Uh, we run seven days a week. Uh, and we're you know, generating these very large data sets of biology and, and the chemistry that impacts them. And so that's, and then we, the way we do that is we are building these fit for machine learning, right? Data scientists design how we run the experiments, which is very different, you know, as a traditional scientist, if I were working on a specific disease, I might design a, an experiment for a specific disease. What we do is we design data sets of biology that then the data can guide us to how we think about the disease or, or how we think about treatments for the disease. And so by building these large data sets, what that allows us to do is that allows us to you know, enable this continuous cycle of learning. Build a large data set. The data set then becomes large enough that our computational tools can infer, for example, where novel biology might lie and what treatments might help it. Then we can check that inference by running it once again in the wet lab. And, and today, so far, with our data set, we have more than 240 billion inferences available to um, our scientists using our computational tools. Obviously, that's a lot of uh, inferences for scientists to look through uh, um, uh, to, to kind of you know, go back and verify uh, you know, whether those inferences actually play out or not in the real world. So I think that's really important, you know, a lot of um, research in this area has tried to take data that's available out in the world and, and maybe bring it together. We have a very, very deep belief that you have to control your data set, you have to control the biology, and you also have to control the quality and relatability of the data set over time. So data we generate today um, can be, sh we can look at it interoperable with data we generated a few years ago. Do you think that, um you know, if, if we don't go this direction, if we don't go the route of AI machine learning, that research will continue to be slow and stagnant. Um, well, I believe we're going this route regardless, so I don't, I don't worry that much about it. Uh, but, I, but it's a fantastic question, right? Because I, I, I have a foot in two worlds. I have a foot in what I would say is the more traditional biopharmaceutical industry world. It's, you know, it's the world I, I come from and, and spent many, have spent many years on in. And I have the, you know, the, the a foot in this world that we're here today, you know, this, this collision technology conference. And I think you know, what I see the reality is um, there is a clear problem to be fixed, whether you are very traditional or very cutting edge within our industry. Nobody accepts having um, a 90% failure rate in, in research and innovation. It's just the, like, think what industry in the world would survive and accept a 90% failure rate, right? It, it's just um, nobody believes it's okay. And so um, that really opens up an opportunity for innovation to solve the problem. And I think a lot of different people are looking at, at a lot of creative ways to solve the problem. Um, there, it, it seems obvious to me that the next generation of life scientists they will be computational life scientists. I can't imagine that, um, you know, maybe if, if I retire a few decades from now and I look back at this point in time, uh, I, I think we're going to be thinking, how on earth did we think we were going to solve biology by drawing, um, you know, two-dimensional <laughs> pathways on pieces of paper or on um, PowerPoint slides? It's just, it, it's just, we finally now have the tools uh, to look at biology as a multi-dimensional problem. And I think, you know, you know, now that those tools are available for us, the world's going to change, right? And that, so I just, I don't, 
I don't think there's an option here because you know our scientists, you know, the creativity has been opened up with these new tools. So that's a kind of the future of the industry then. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about those illnesses, oncology, uh, so cancer, and when we're talking about neurological disorders um, that don't have a lot of research poured into them, what is the future at recursion? How are you going to tackle these these major diseases, and how are you going to use the AI to do that? Yeah. Well, um, we. We've got, I mentioned earlier, one thing is that we don't believe in doing anything alone, right? right? It's going to take the scientific community to attack these diseases. So while I'm certainly incredibly proud of the work um, you know, our team is doing, uh, you know, we also do, as I mentioned, work with you know, pharmaceutical partners and, and really think about how the scientific community is going to tackle these diseases. And I think one thing that's really interesting to me is, you know, we've talked actually a lot about machine learning, artificial intelligence, but um, there's more technological convergence going on here. Um, laboratory automation, right? The reason we can run, you know, two million experiments every week is, is due to robotics, right? Like these aren't humans pipetting liquids around at, at that rate, right? It's, it's the revolution in robotics. Um, in addition to that, uh, what we haven't talked about either is, is the revolution in our ability to manipulate biology. You know, we use um, technology, for example, a technology called CRISPR, which allows us to exquisitely model um, genetic diseases. You mentioned neurofibromatosis too is a genetic disease. And so you know, as, as all of these tools come together and converge, you know, my hope, my dream, and my belief for recursion is that we're going to lead the way in this industry that's going to be a, a digitally native, technology-enabled way to think about disease, to think about life science, and um, beyond just what recursion does, like, I truly believe that's just going to, once again, kind of change what it even means to be a life scientist and what it means to think about disease, what it means to find a new drug. And the, the beauty of that, like any innovation, you don't know exactly how that's going to play out. So we're just about out of time. Um, and I do want to say, I think that we've made the point very clear that AI absolutely is disrupting um, the pharmaceutical industry. And that is the future of the pharmaceutical industry. You touched on a bunch of things there, you know, about um, uh, CRISPR, for example, and there are ethical things that we could talk about mm -hmm. as well. But the, the message, I think, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, AI and machine learning and um, taking this um, traditional science and future of science is really going to be how we develop these new treatments and cures. Yep, absolutely. And it's, um, you know, I, I don't want to oversimplify how hard medicine is. You know, I think this is something particularly um, since, we, you know, we, we have a tech crowd here today. Uh, Biology is complex. Medicine is even more complex because it involves people. And so, um, you know, one question we get a lot is about, like, you know, can AI really impact medicine? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. What I do try to tell people is it's not going to do it overnight. Mm -hmm. um, even though I think in this crowd it's very obvious that artificial intelligence, machine learning, is, you know, these are the technologies that are impacting the pharma industry. It is very hard to, to develop drugs. It is a very meaningful thing to give a human being um, a new drug that's never been tried before in a human. And so um, we do need to both be um, excited about going to the future and also be very um, thoughtful and ethical and, and to some extent uh, patiently urgent about getting these new treatments out to patients. Amazing. Tina, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you guys for sitting through this. Right. Take care. Thank you, Jamie.